Hello, and welcome to the first edition of Three Sunday New York Times Relong for 2022. Our guest this week is Joe Nocera, longtime business columnist, magazine writer, and author. He's also the writer and host of The Shrink Next Door, a podcast that was turned into an Apple TV show. He has written for Fortune, The New York Times, and Bloomberg News. My name is Neil Parekh. I am the executive producer and guest host of Sri's Sunday New York Times Read Along and the vice president of events and communications at Digimentors. We are live on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and YouTube. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for uh, all of your support over the last several years. Sri has been hosting this show for six years, and I've been working with him for about four years now. And it's been an incredible uh, pleasure, an incredible run. Thank you so much. We have such a great community that's been built up over the years. What I wanna do is to give you a quick uh, preview of the show uh, and uh, uh, walk you through some of the content that we'll be covering uh, in today's program. We have every uh, uh, week we do a Twitter thread um, that that highlights various uh, um, various pieces that we'll cover. So let's go ahead and walk through that uh, right now. Um, we have uh, you know the, the promo piece. We're going to cover, as I mentioned, the shrink next door. Uh, Joe's writing for the New York Times. He recently rejoined uh, to write for Dealbook. Um, there's also several pieces around January 6th, in particular the uh, magazine cover story uh, about the impact on the Capitol Police um, from last year, uh, in particularly the, emo the emotional impact. Uh, and then, of course, Sidney Poitier, who passed away this week at the age of 94. Uh, we certainly will, will review some of that. Uh, as I mentioned, The Shrink Next Door, uh, it was made into an Apple TV show uh, starring uh, Will Ferrell and Paul Rudd. Um, we also will talk about uh, a, a piece that Joe wrote about uh, mental health, about his own battles with depression. Uh, we'll cover his work with Dealbook. We'll also talk about his work uh, on the NCAA, uh, student athletes, and uh, you know their their experience in terms of you know quote unquote being amateurs and not allowed to get paid. Uh, for the work that they do. Um, Jimmy Carter wrote an op-ed in the uh, guest essay in the Sunday Review. There are several other pieces in the Sunday Review section, so we'll take a look at that as well. Of course, I mentioned Sidney Poitier. And then, uh, of course, uh, the Sunday New York Times Read Along is produced by Digimentors, the social and digital consulting firm that Sri started several years ago. Uh, we have a great team, Paula Kiger, uh, Steve Taylor, Julia Weeks, and Carla Baranakis help us produce the show uh, every week. Uh, so we want to give them a shout out as well. Um, and uh, we want to thank our sponsor, Muckrack. Uh, and here is Joe's uh, um, profile on Muckrack. Uh, so thank you, Muckrack, for all of, all of your support for the uh, New York Times uh, read along. So, with that, what I'd like to do is to also um, walk through. Uh, the paper uh, a little bit, and we'll also do a recap of the guests from 2021. But before we do that, let's welcome some of our viewers uh, who are joining in. We have Jonathan Borstein uh, joining us from the East Village. Jonathan, always great to see you. My mom watching from Tampa, Florida. Mom, hi mom. Thank you so much. Always appreciate you watching. Dr. Sujana Chandrasekhar, uh, one of the hosts of She's On Call with Dr. Marina Kurian is watching. My sister is watching from Bellevue, Washington. Hey, Amy, how you doing? Um, it's 5.30 in the morning, uh, her time. So uh, it's always uh, uh, a nice surprise when she's able to join. Uh, and another West Coaster, Doug Levy, is joining from San near San Francisco. Uh, Diane Stefani is watching from Margate, New Jersey. Uh, hi, Diane. Uh, Bob Veritoni is joining, also from New Jersey, from New Milford. We, Jersey is, is in the house. Stefan Kaplan, another uh, Jerseyite, 
watching from Ramsey, New Jersey, uh, wishing everyone a, a safe 22. Patricia Freudenberg watching on LinkedIn uh, from New York. Thank you, Patricia. Um, we have Srinath Reddy watching, uh, saying hello. Uh, thank you, uh, Srinatha. Um, and we have Miriam Berkeley watching from Hell's Kitchen. Miriam, I have to say, your puddle pictures are great. Uh, watch her on social media. She does these great reflections uh, of the street uh, and, and, and buildings, et cetera. So check them out, watching from Hell's Kitchen uh, in New York. Um, Samantha, uh, Srinath Reddy is from, uh, watching from uh, Bengaluru. Uh, Natasha uh, is watching from Puerto Rico. Uh, Natasha, uh, thank you for joining us. I uh, appreciate it. Susan is watching from Reading, Connecticut. Uh, Nikhil is watching from Florida. Um, and uh, Paula, one of our producers, agrees with uh, my comment about Miriam's uh, picks. They are definitely great. Um, she is uh, from Tallahassee. And another uh, uh, guest, uh, visitor, Deanna, is watching from Hilton Head uh, Island. So thank you so much. Uh, really appreciate everyone watching. Please uh, 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 comment. Please like. Please share. Let people know that you're watching. Uh, we have a great guest today. Joe Nocera uh, will be joining us. We're definitely looking forward to that uh, conversation. Uh, before we proceed, I want to just do a quick uh, review. We had a, a number of great guests in 2021. Uh, and uh, you know, in particular, I want to thank Carla Baranakis, one of our producers. She really hit several home runs with some of the guests that we got. Um, so take a, uh, uh, take a break and watch this recap from last year. That was great. What an incredible lineup from last year. Uh, and again, we really appreciate all the work that goes into uh, putting this show together, in particular, booking such great guests. Um, so we really do uh, want to thank Carla um, for all of that work in particular. Uh, many of those uh, Pulitzer Prize winners, uh, longtime New York Times uh, writers, uh, were personal friends of hers, colleagues of hers. So thank you, Carla, uh, for everything that you, that you did. 
uh, Ken Fisher uh, is watching from Iowa. Thank you, uh, Ken. Uh, Ellen Austin is watching from uh, the uh, Sunless Upper East Side. Um, and uh, Patricia says, fantastic reflection on 2021. Thank you. Um, and uh, Bob is asking for a Twitter list uh, for all of our guests. Bob, absolutely. That's what uh, one thing we're working on today is we'll set up a Twitter list. Um, and so we'll make sure to share that with folks uh, later. So thank you very much. So uh, with that, uh, let's go ahead and, and take a quick look at what's in the uh, paper. Uh, and then we will um, get to uh, uh, Joe Nocera in just a moment. Um, so here is the paper. Uh, and uh, what's interesting this week is this actually is an ad um, that was in the paper. It was wrap around, uh, you know, the whole thing, chicken is broken. Um, so it's a, a full four page ad uh, about making chickens better by making it out of plants, which is interesting. Um, so a whole vegetarian um, thing, daring.com is the website. So literally when I got the paper this morning, it was a four page wrap around the whole thing. Uh, we always like to pay attention to what's in the uh, ads. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, what are the specials in the paper? So in terms of, we'll just take a look at the front page, front pages before we bring on Joe. This is the uh, A1 section. The display story is about Russia and how uh, it's a really interesting graphic in terms of how they're effectively surrounding uh, Ukraine on three fronts, uh, getting ready for war um, and what it looks like. The lead story is about Omicron, of course. Omicron's march in perils labor peace in schools. A lot of teachers are expressing concern about um, going back to school, about how uh, schools are handling. Um, and, and there's a huge backlash from parents. I'll tell you personally, we live here in uh, Fairfax County, Virginia, and um, this is one of the things that turned the election to the Republican Glenn Youngkin. Um, all of this effort, you know, keep uh, Fairfax schools open. Um, we are firmly on the other side of that, of that fence. Um, remote learning worked for us, not in the first you know, uh, few months when they were trying to figure it out, but last year, uh, our daughter Emily did well with remote learning. Um, and uh, I'm gonna, we're gonna put safety first, uh, both for our students and for uh, teachers. Um, other stories on the front page uh, about the New York City Police Department. Uh, and at the bottom of the page, Tesla's edge in pandemic, superior command of supply chains. So they're not dealing with some of the supply chain issues. Um, in port of, portrait of Mayor's mother, many see a family heirloom. Uh, and then this picture starting over in Colorado, the Mance family's home was among about a thousand leveled in that fast moving fire just last week. So that's what we have for the uh, front page. Here's the Sunday review that I mentioned earlier and there's business tucked in. So the, the lead story effectively in Sunday review, the feature, is a uh, op-ed by Jimmy Carter for democracy, but there are several other pieces around January 6th. And this, uh, the graphic shows um, a flag with a corner of the fighting that you can see right there. So we'll take a look at that um, when we get to the Sunday review. Sunday business, no more working for jerks. Bleared employees are standing up to bad bosses and obnoxious colleagues or fleeing. Um, and you can, and there's also a piece, one cure for Hollywood's blues, a $44 salad. Um, but certainly the, the impact of the pandemic on employee relations has been tremendous. Here's the arts section. And this is actually a really well done piece. Uh, a lot of great artwork, five pieces of joy, five minutes long, a quick start guide to falling in love with classical music. But you can see the art uh, work and the graphic design is really, really interesting. We have uh, Sunday Styles. What has Ron Perlman learned? A billionaire whose debt came uh, due ponders the future. Uh, so we'll take a look at that. And Cinderella by way of uh, Casavetes, and I may not be uh, pronouncing that right, Annie Hamilton, whose posts are endearing and impossible to categorize. Um, we have the book review. Uh, we'll turn that around real quick. Um, turn, turn, turn. 
can an Asian American woman write a great American novel? That's an interesting question. Uh, so we'll take a look at that. And then, of course, the New York Times Magazine, uh, which is an incredible piece, and we'll, we'll uh, take a close look. The scars of January 6th. For many officers of the U.S. Capitol Police, their bodies, minds, and lives will never be the same. Um, this is a really well-researched, well-done piece, it's detailed portraits and interviews with a number of officers who were on the front lines that day. Um, he's not quoted in this piece, but my neighbor, uh, Stephen Karlachak, uh, was on the front lines that day. He's a, a bike patrol officer. He was a colleague of Brian Sicknick, the first person who died as a result of his injuries um, that uh, that fateful day. So we'll we'll definitely spend some time there. But before we get into the uh, the paper and and go through those uh, various stories, uh, I want to uh, uh, make sure you know that our guest today uh, is Joe Nocera. Um, Joe is uh, a longtime business columnist and uh, a, a writer, a magazine writer and author, and he's uh, the writer and host of The Shrink Next Door. He's written for Fortune, The New York Times, and Bloomberg News. Uh, so with that, uh, we're going to bring on uh, Joe Nocera. Joe, uh, thank hi. you for joining us. Uh, How are you doing? Thanks for having me. I, well, I'm a little nervous about my Wi-Fi right now, but other than that, I'm fine. So let's see what happens. Well, we'll keep our our fingers crossed. See? If it, if it gets to a point where your Wi-Fi is looking uh, uh, iffy, it, it was fine when we tested and and before the show. You can always press stop cam would... on your computer if you need to. Stop. All righty. Um, stop. Hopefully, if I you won't. need to do the. We'll, we'll, we'll work through it. We'll work through it. Okay. But so, Joe, uh, the first okay. question that we ask all of our guests, um, and uh, again, thank you for joining us, uh, is uh, how have you fared over the last uh, almost now two years with uh, the pandemic? Well, you know, as a member of the Zoom class, I've done just fine. Um, we have a house out in Southampton, as people who've watched The Shrink Next Door well know, and and, um, and I've spent most of I spent most of the pandemic there. I've, I've got a book contract uh, to write a book about COVID and the economy with my close friend and colleague Bethany McLean. Um, you know, uh, Neil, I, I I our child was in fourth grade public school in New York City. And I found remote learning to be such a complete, utter, unmitigated disaster. Wow. That we put him in a private school that was committed to five days, you know, if I understand that, you know, that's because I have a job, I have money, I have, you know, I, I, I'm able to do that. And I fully understand that there are tons and tons and tons of people who weren't who weren't so lucky. No. I, and, you know, we were actually in Fairfax County, uh, Virginia, um, one of the, the most well-resourced school districts uh, in the country. When we first shut down in uh, 2020 in March, that those first uh, three months at the end of the year, they couldn't shoot straight. They started and stopped three times uh, and finally gave up and just sent videos for kids to watch. Um, yeah. Over the, in the fall, they actually were able to figure it out. Uh, and, you know, I, I think one of the things that we were also, and, and you had the resources to be able to put uh, uh, your child in private school, our, our resources really were, was my wife. She was at home with uh, our daughter. Our daughter's in third grade. She was able to sit with her and help her, uh, you know, keep her on task, keep her, you know, paying attention, et cetera. Um, but for others that didn't have the resources, where their schools didn't have the resources, where parents didn't have the resources, absolutely. Uh, much less uh, having to, you know, help when, when families had multiple kids in school and parents both working from home or parents who had to go in if they were essential workers, uh, certainly, uh, certainly a challenge. 
Um, well, I just want to say, I don't want to, we don't want to spend a lot of time on this, but I could not disagree with you more about sure. whether schools should be open or closed. You were, you were, you were, I know you were a proponent of remote learning and be on the side That's of fine. safety, but, but, but the truth of the matter is uh, study after study after study showed that students uh, were quite safe in school and the intransigence of the teachers union, uh, it was infuriating to me because the harm that has been done to students who have missed that much school is irreparable, not to mention depression, you know, suicidal ideation, um, uh, you know, abuse. I, I just, uh, school, school is the safest place for, for most of the kids in public school. And they should have been in school. Fair point. I appreciate uh, some of those uh, points in particular. Um, so, but moving on, on from there, uh, what I want to ask you about is over the course of the pandemic, uh, you had, um, you, you were, you turned your, uh, to, to work. What were you focusing on over the last, uh, year and a half? Um, well, you know, I, I was hired as a, you know, my, my life has been a business writer, um, primarily, um, and, um, I was hired by Bloomberg primarily to be a business writer, to be a business columnist. But, you know, once you got into the pandemic, I, I think that kind of overwhelmed everybody and everything. And I, you know, I probably wrote one out of every three or four columns was pandemic related in, in one way, shape or form. You know, one of the points I was trying to make early on, which got a whole lot of flack was that, um, that the pandemic uh, does not really care about whether you're in a blue state or a red state. And um, sure. it does what it does. Uh, all people who were condemning DeSantis were probably wrong. And all, all the people, all the people who were praising Cole were probably wrong because in the end, you know, the, 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 the pandemic had its own rhyme and reason and, 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 and it overwhelmed everybody's effort, no matter which, which, which way they went. And, and Omicron is certainly proving that now. Um, so, so that's one of the things I wrote about. And then, and then about, I would say some in once again, end of 2020, uh, Bethany and I decided, we had written All the Devil Together, which is a book about the, you know, the, what led up to the financial crisis of 2008. And we thought that offered a chance to do a similar kind of approach to what to why the country was on un, so unprepared economically for the pandemic and why and and then what was the result of covid on the economy from from you know from zoom to uh, uh, to restaurants got it got it um, and so one of the other projects that you were involved with that really you know saw great uh, light over the last two years was uh, what started off as a, originally as a magazine article uh, with the New York Times became That's a right. uh, hit podcast right. and uh, and a TV show, uh, yep. The Shrink Next Door, and uh, we'll certainly uh, want to give people at least a, a sense of what the uh, podcast page uh, looks like. Uh, so you should definitely check this out if you haven't heard of The Shrink Next Door. Um, it's uh, is, like I said, a successful uh, podcast. But tell us about how this story uh, came about. I'm on the right network. I don't know why this is happening. Anyway, The Shrink Next Door um, was a story about da 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 a shrink next door. I, I, I moved <laughs> into a place uh, in Southampton. Um, we all thought that the guy next door was a big shot a psychiatrist from New York City. We thought that this little guy who was around the grounds all the time was the caretaker. Um, uh, he, he invites me to a party, he invites my wife and I for a drink. We come back the next summer <clears throat> and the shrink has disappeared. And the little, guy in, in, the little guy who we thought was the caretaker comes over to my house, <clears throat> excuse me, with a woman that I'd never seen before. And he says, Joe, I'd lucky to so that caught my attention. Um, so I spent the next, uh, you know, in bits and pieces trying to put this together for the New York Times Magazine. Um, 
three days before publication. It was going to be on the cover. They had photographs taken, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, it was killed, I think. I don't know why, really, but uh, Jill Abramson and, and Hugo were at La and Hugo Lindgren, who was then the magazine editor at Loggerheads. And um, anyway, I got killed. I put it in my bottom drawer and then suddenly realized after I got to Bloomberg that, you know, this new thing called podcasting was happening and maybe The Shrink Next Door might make a good podcast. And that's basically what happened. And then uh, after that, it got uh, turned into an Apple TV show starring Will Ferrell and Paul Rudd. Yeah, that what was, was the kind impact? Of fun. <laughs> yeah, were you were you uh, uh, a producer on that? Did they uh, work with you closely, or? No, nah, I had um, I had a couple of conversations with the screenwriting team, and um, actually, this was kind of exciting. Paul Rudd and. Will Farrell and Michael Showalter, the director, came to the Hamptons to have to spend a day with Marty and Phyllis. Um, Marty was the, the the quote unquote Marty was the actual owner of the house and the, mm -hmm. the so called caretaker. And um, uh, so uh, my wife and I were invited to that lunch, so so they wanted to talk to us as well. But other than that, you you <laughs> you probably don't remember this, but uh, Michael Kinsley, uh, when he was editing the New Republic, used to have a great phrase sentence for the perfect kind of writer if you're an editor. He turns in his story and gets hit by a bus. And, um, <laughs> and that's kind of that's kind of what I was. And, and that was fine. They bought it. They could do what they want with it. I wasn't, you know, they didn't send me scripts or anything. Um, they did actually at one point, but it was mostly just for my pleasure, not, not to kibitz. So I stayed out of the way. I thought they did a really good job. I thought uh, Paul Rudd was a little nicer than the real Ike in real life, but, but, um, and I, I think the show was not as dark as the podcast is. The podcast is a really, it's a dark show. And, um, um, but the, you know, they had, they had their own, you know, they had their own channel for making decisions and I can't argue with any of those. I enjoyed the show. That's, that's great. Um, and so then uh, in addition to the, the shrink next door, uh, you've actually, your, your journey having written for fortune, you were, uh, writing for the New York Times for a number of years. Um, you you were on the uh, uh, business, you went to the opinion pages, you also wrote about sports for uh, quite a while. Uh, one of the issues that you really focused on was the NCAA. Uh, That's right. And this whole issue of, of quote unquote, uh, student athletes. Um, first talk of to all, us about that a little bit. Yeah, first of all, let's not call them student athletes because that's a term of propaganda. Quote unquote. That was a term of propaganda created in 1956 to avoid workers having to pay players workers' compensation. Mm -hmm. um, but I got into it in 2010. Again, Hugo Lindren um, at the magazine uh, gave me an assignment. He said, you know, if you were going to pay players, what would it look like? So that was the assignment. But what happened was in reporting that, it was an eye-opening experience because although I was a lifelong sports fan, I never really thought about these issues before. And as I dove into it, I started to realize that these players were really being exploited um, in, a, in, a, in a really ugly way and that they were, they were not getting the education they were supposed to get, that their sports came first, that they were working 50 hours a week on the sport. And there, there was something just wrong. And, 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 and the NCAA had all these horrible rules and regulations that really kept them, as I put, as I said in, in, in a book that I wrote about it, indentured, kept them indentured. And um, uh, so I, I, got, I got passionate about it. And um, I started writing about it, once the magazine story came out, I started writing about it for the op-ed page, which was a very uh, unusual thing for somebody to do on the op-ed page. So much so that in the beginning, I used to get uh, emails from time to time saying, why are you doing this? If I wanna, if I wanna read sports, I'll go to the sports page. I, I don't come to op-ed to read about sports. And I would respond by saying, I don't view this as a sports issue. I view this as a human rights issue and a civil rights issue because so many of these exploited players were African-American. And um, eventually, you know, that kind of email stopped and gradually, much to my amazement, but also delight, 
you could you could see the culture sort of coming around to the point of view that I'd had and and Taylor Branch and the Atlantic had had and and Jay Billis um, at ESPN had had and and not a whole lot of others when I first started on this road, but by you know last year, um, Brett Kavanaugh and the Supreme Court wrote a a um, uh, a concurrent opinion about the NCAA that honestly could have been one of my columns. It was so strong and, and, and meant no words and, and really sort of said, you know, this is wrong and something needs to be done about it. And he practically begged, uh, he practically begged for another case to be brought before the court that was less limiting than the one that was before them so they could blow the whole system up. I mean, he really, it was, it was unbelievable. And here's that book indentured uh, that you wrote. Um, the, the battle Ben's, to end the exploitation of college athletes uh, yeah. with, by you and Ben Strauss. Right. And Ben Strauss, I found he, he was originally going to be my researcher. Um, he was a stringer for the Times in Chicago, and I, I needed him to do something on an article. And um, when I started the book, I hired him as a researcher. And he he's a smart kid. And he realized that uh, given my day job, I was never going to get this book done. Uh, if I was just doing it myself. So he came to me and he said, let's cut a deal. You know, I'll be your co-author. And, and I said, wow, oh, that sounds pretty good. Let's do it. So, uh, so that's what happened. Great, great. Uh, I want to take a, uh, a quick moment and welcome a few other folks that have uh, joined us uh, since we started. Our guest, of course, is Joe Nocera. Um, and Linda Lawrence uh, joining us from Long Island. Linda, thank you, uh, as always. Uh, and uh, Chitachi uh, is joining us from uh, uh, Florida, from Fort Lauderdale. Uh, Rose is joining us from Connecticut. Uh, Rose Horowitz, uh, she's uh, one of our colleagues at Digimenters uh, and has a great show herself that she hosts, Women to Follow. Uh, follow her on Twitter, Rose Horowitz 31 um, and uh, uh, just wanted to, to acknowledge a few other folks. Patricia Freudenberg has a question for you, Joe. Uh, she wants to know, who would you say was your most memorable mentor in your um, career? I have two. Um, I have three. <laughs> <laughs> three, go ahead. The first is Charlie Peters, uh, who was my first mentor, who was the editor, uh, a longtime editor and founder of the Washington Monthly. Uh, I'm one of the many, many... Um, uh, journalists who have come out of the Washington Monthly, like Jim Fallows, Mick Lemon, uh, Greg Easterbrook, uh, Jonathan Alter. Uh, it, it's it's to Nick uh, uh, Connoisseuri at um, um, uh, Confessori at at the Times. It's a long list. So he was my first mentor. Uh, my second one, I would say, is Nick Lemon, um, uh, who who was the executive editor at Texas Monthly when I was there and uh, who's been a lifelong friend and who is as smart about how to edit and write a magazine story as anybody on the face of the earth. Um, uh, and of course, I think it was Shree's boss for a while at Columbia, right? Columbia Journalism School. And then the third would be uh, John Huey, at, uh, who was the editor of Fortune Magazine when I was there. And he was an extraordinary character, larger than life, very charismatic. And he really, I had always previously just wanted to write stories where there was nobody else competing with me, you know, where it's like I was on my own. And, 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 and Huey basically taught me, you know, basically to, to, to not be afraid to get in a mix with other people and, and, and uh, just outright them and outthink them. Great. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, also want to give a shout out to Laura Silverman watching from Philadelphia. Uh, as you can see, we have a, a wide range of folks watching. Uh, as I mentioned, about 70% of our viewers are, are part of the New York Times Read Along family. They come uh, show us regularly on Sunday mornings, 8.30 a.m. Eastern time. But we also get new people that join us uh, from time to time. So thank you to everyone for you know, making the show what it is. You know, it's, it's great to have great guests. It's great to have the newspaper, uh, but without you, we wouldn't really have a, a show, as I'm sure you would agree, without listeners to your podcast, it really wouldn't uh, be, be what it is. It'd be, it'd be That's right. um, you know, 
you'd be alone out there. Debbie Deborah Burnick is watching from uh, Washington D.C. Uh, and uh, uh, Vale uh, Gaia is watching as well on Facebook. So thank you. Um, another topic, uh, Joe um, uh, and Vale is watching from Italy. Uh, so I want to pull that out as well. Um, so in terms of your work, and, and we talked talk a little bit about how you moved from um, uh, Fortune to the New York Times to the sports desk, you went to, to Bloomberg. Um, you wrote uh, a piece when you were at Bloomberg uh, very eloquently about mental health uh, and uh, you know, your own battles with depression. Uh, this was after the very, um, uh, you know, the, the news of uh, the suicides of Kate Spade and uh, um, Anthony Bourdain. Um, can you tell us a little bit about uh, that piece you wrote? What prompted you to write that uh, and to, to talk about your own uh, challenges? Yeah, well, um, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a pretty uh, avid Twitter follower, and uh, I've seen over the years uh, a handful of people coming out of the closet about depression, you know, usually linked to an article they'd written or something. Um, and, and it had been in the back of my mind that, that, you know, this is something maybe I ought to do because, you know, I do believe it's a disease. It's not a, it's not a character flaw. And um, uh, I, 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 I certainly want to uh, uh, demystify it and make it sort of something that's not to be ashamed about. Uh, one of the things I said at the end of the column was that, um, you know, cancer used to be something people were ashamed of. And now it's just, it's a disease, you know, it's not. Um, uh, and, um, and so when Kate Spade and Anthony Bourdain uh, committed suicide, tragically, you know, I, I thought this is the time that I should do this because, you know, here are two highly successful people. And, you know, if you're, if you're, if you're just watching them from the outside, you think to yourself, well, how can they, how can someone like that commit suicide? And you just don't understand what demons they're fighting and so on. So I just thought, yeah, it's time. And, um, you know, as, as you didn't, you know, this, m most of my, all of, all of my periods of depression took place while I was at the New York times. And so, um, it was very, uh, what's the right word? Uh, you know, so, so in describing what happened, I had to also talk about, you know, what happened with me at the New York Times. And, and it's something I think that, um, you know, many people deal with in silence. Many people, uh, you know, right. assume and it's I, just them. And I tried to do that. Several on several occasions, and I really do think it damaged me because, um, you know, as I was on the op-ed page and I was trying to write two columns a week, and I could barely think straight. It was just horrible, and um, uh, you know, I made a couple of big mistakes that that soured Andy Rosenthal on me. He didn't like me that much anyway, but um, it, you know, and then and then when I got to the sports page, uh, you know, I had another I had another bout of depression. And Jason Stallman was the editor at the time. And, and, and he, I went and told him that I was depressed and he was a little, he was taken aback. And I first said, well, I want to keep working. I don't want to take leave. And he realized a couple of, within a couple of days that that was an untenable situation that I was acting erratically and so on. So, you know, he sent me up to HR and, um, and I went on and I went on um, uh, sick leave and I was really out for a long time, like six months until I got better and, and got on the right meds. And, and let me just tell you one other thing quickly. Um, one, of the good, <clears throat> one of the good things about writing that story is that uh, over the course of the years since I wrote it, I, I got calls from three or four times people who were suffering from depression themselves saying, what should I do? And I said to them, you know, go tell your boss and then go to HR because it turns out the Times is really, really good about this. And um, they give you the time you need and assuming you have enough leave, leave, you know, you get paid, your, you get paid a medical leave salary and nobody's pushing you to come back until you're ready. Um, 
And I was very, very thankful of that when I was depressed and, and, and gradu gradually trying to get better. And, and I, everybody that I have suggested that they do that, and after they did it, they would call and tell me, you were right. You know, this was the right way to deal with this. That's, that's great. I think that uh, there are a lot of things to uh, pick up in that, in that story and that experience that you shared, you know, not just uh, admitting it to yourself and being able to talk about it, but to be able to talk about it with uh, your employer and, and your bosses right. and to be able to bring it up um, to get the time and space you needed um, to, to work through things. And it's not, as you wrote in, in the article, it's not something that happens once and you get over it and then you're done. Uh, it becomes a, a, uh, you know, ongoing, uh, yeah. challenge. Uh, it, some books have referred to it as the beast, uh, that is looming, um, that can, can, can yeah. enter your life at various points. Uh, you might hold it at bay for a bit. It's, it's almost, I would almost liken it somewhat uh, similar to, and I don't, from, not from personal experience, but from uh, my understanding of addiction and, and alcoholism, you know, you, you are always an alcoholic. Uh, it's a question of how you're dealing with that uh, and whether you're able to stay, um, you know, right. uh, sober. Um, depression well, is something that's always there. You know, there are, there right? are meds. I'm like, Unlike alcoholism, uh, there are meds that can treat somebody like me who doesn't have chronic, severe, oppressive depression, but has depressive mm -hmm. uh, uh, spells, I guess I would put Episodes. it. Manic, manic, yeah. manic spells, depression spells. But anyway, I, I haven't had, you know, that last one, I finally got on the right meds. And, you know, I really haven't had an incident since. I, um, I... I, I'm aware of my myself and I'm aware if I'm sliding or getting manic or whatever, and, and, and really hasn't happened. So I'm, I'm feeling pretty lucky. That's, that's great. And, and again, I'm so glad that you were able to get the support and the help that you need. It really seems to have touched a nerve with uh, our viewers, a number of comments. Uh, we'll just review some of those. Chatati uh, says it goes to show that money and notoriety can't fix uh, everything. Um, I think we're too often fooled into thinking that money equals happiness. Um, Paula uh, is grateful that for your candor, uh, sharing openly about our mental health challenges is the only way to support each other uh, and realize the, the need. Um, Laura Silverman, uh, it's so important to bring mental health issues into the open. Um, and thank you for that. Uh, Paula shared, uh, she recently read a Sarah Bareilles can I, can article I, about- Can I- Please. Please. It's not, it is, it's, I don't view it as courageous. I don't view it as an act of courage. I really don't. Okay. It's like, you, you do this and everybody says you're courageous, but you're just telling a story about yourself, like many other stories about yourself and you're doing it to help other people. And um, I mean, Courage would be if 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 you knew there was going to be this giant backlash. But at this point in the society, you're not going to get a giant backlash. You're just going to get love. So I, anyway, I just don't. I didn't think of it as a courageous act. That that's all I'm really meaning to say. Fair, fair enough. Uh, and, and I think that uh, uh, I think things have certainly evolved over over time. I think you're right that we are in a. Uh, maybe a better place now than, you know, even several years ago. Uh, and, and people do step I up agree with to that. offer, yeah. offer support. Um, Natasha yeah. uh, says there's many articles that have been written about how COVID you mentioned this earlier in terms of uh, children, how uh, COVID has affected uh, mental health and uh, depression and isolation. My mom actually uh, was a psychotherapist. Uh, and so she actually uh, said very few people, can talk about their symptoms and uh, its impact. Um, uh, Patricia says, thank wait, you wait, uh, wait. as well. Her last, her last sentence, her last sentence. You inspired a lot of people, your, mo your mom said. Thanks, well, I, mom. I thought maybe you did. I thought you would disagree with her. I didn't want to provoke you again, uh, <laughs> that you were being, uh, at least she didn't call you courageous, right? That's, ah, uh, thank you. That would have been too far, bridge too far. Yes, bridge um, too far. But, uh, uh, Rose uh, uh, saying, appreciating that you shared uh, how you've dealt with depression. Naomi Service is watching as well. 
uh, from New York. Depression is an equal opportunity uh, offender. Um, Deborah mentions uh, NAMI. Uh, I believe that's the National, National Associate Alliance for Mental Illness, um, with chapters in every city offering support for families. Um, and uh, Nikhil is uh, saying it's great that you haven't had an incident uh, but what, recently, but wondering if the meds have also reduced the highs and lows and the drive to get work done. Have you seen an impact in terms of your um, production or, or kind of focus? Has it dulled the edges? That is an awesome question. And um, uh, let, me, let me tell you the reason. Okay, so the, 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 the drug that I needed to be on to, to stabilize was lithium. Right. And because that's the great stabilizer for people who have bipolar. And I resisted it and resisted it and resisted it for this exact reason. I was worried about the, the, the side effects and whether it would whether it would dull whether it would dull my senses. And it, I'm lucky in that the amount that I turned out to need to stabilize was really not that much. And so I, it has not affected my ability to work and it is not what it, what it, it definitely has affected the highs and lows, but that's a good thing because my highs were, 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 were insane. I mean, they were totally manic and, you know, I could write 3000 words in four hours and, and, but that was, you know, it was just, it was, it was, and, but I would do, um, uh, uh, risky, uh, you know, stupid risky things when I was manic. And then I would get depressed and could barely get out of bed. So, so, you know, reducing the highs and lows is a good thing, but it didn't affect, it does not affect my ability to work or think or, you know, anything like that. Great. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, Carla, uh, Carla's uh, contribution, depression is often compared to diabetes in that medication can help manage it. Uh, and as Joe said, it's a disease, not a character flaw. Uh, absolutely, absolutely. Um, I will, uh, I will say, and, uh, and she also offers, uh, you know, Paula, uh, threw in the a link to NAMI if people are interested. And Carla also shares the, uh, resource for the National Suicide Prevention Hotline. Uh, certainly if anyone is, um, uh, experiencing suicidal ideation, thoughts of, of hurting yourself or harming yourself, please reach out um, and uh, get the support you need. Uh, you can de definitely call the, uh, the hotline. Um, Liz says, thank you for letting us know that the paper became more woke over the years um, in regard to uh, mental health. Um, and uh, she has a, a shout out to people who uh, were lost. Um, Aegis uh, Salpukas, Alan Meyerson, Carol Threlfail. Uh, if I'm pronouncing it correctly, uh, thank you, Liz. Um, what I what I was going to offer, uh, Joe, and 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 this is, um, you know, it, it doesn't, it's not a question of of comparing, but what I'll say is this: uh, you were talking about how uh, uh, society has evolved to a certain point. It's not a courageous thing to talk about mental illness. Um, I've actually talked on this show. Um, uh, in the past, we've done several uh, uh, episodes that touch on um, uh, sexual abuse, uh, certainly around the Brett Kavanaugh hearings. Uh, and uh, we did uh, an interview with a colleague of mine, former colleague from United Way, um, who is a uh, uh, survivor of rape. Uh, I've talked about my own experience being abused as a child by a neighbor. Um, and it was a very poignant uh, show. This is what I talk about the New York Times read along family. I, I felt this was a safe space for me to talk about that, uh, that experience. What I've actually said to people, uh, and I remember in particular one dinner that I had uh, with a friend is that I was more comfortable talking about being abused and sharing that story than I was talking about mental illness, about my own struggles with anxiety and depression. And so I'm doing that now for the first time that I also suffer, not, not manic in, in the same way that you were describing, but I've had several uh, depressive episodes um, and, uh, you know, uh, at times severe anxiety. Um, 
it's not something I ever spoke about, spoke to my employers about. Um, one things that I, one of the things that I found is when I was working as a, as a consultant on my own with large gaps of time where I wasn't, didn't need to be anywhere. That's when, when it would, uh, take over uh, when I was left to my own devices. As my career has evolved, I've gotten busier, even though I'm working as a consultant now, uh, effectively. I am so busy, I'm, so, I'm engaged, I'm on so often, I don't have the space to, to do that. Um, mm. But I will, I will say, I mean, I know you said it's not courageous. I'm, I'm trying to uh, um, uh, ride on your, your coattails with that. Uh, it's not something that I've been comfortable talking about or sharing. That's interesting. Um, yeah, and yeah. Uh, and like I said, I, I remember a particular dinner where I was talking with people that I was comfortable. I said, you know, I'll talk about being sexually abused. I don't know that I can talk about seeing a therapist. I don't know that I could talk about having um, anxiety. Um, so thank you, Joe, for all right. Well, for thank you for your what you've done. Um, I appreciate that. I appreciate that. All right. Um, so again, another, uh, uh, great show, uh, Robin Summers. Thank you for talking about it. Um, and, uh, um, Rose is thanking Paula for, um, all the links, Chitachi, uh, and Rose. Uh, thank you. Appreciate, uh, your support as well. Uh, and Laura, uh, and all three of them, I remember were watching, uh, that show that we did from my uh, the house I grew up in in New York when we talked about my experience as a child. So with that, it's 9.22, uh, uh, and uh, we want to talk about the paper. And in particular, we want to get Joe's thoughts on the uh, uh, Sunday review, the uh, opinion section that he wrote for for so long. Um, so uh, with that, Joe, we'll turn our attention to the paper uh, and um, uh, uh, see what's uh, in store uh, for today. Okay. So, of course, uh, the first piece is the uh, um, the New York Times Magazine article. Uh, that's what we left off with um, when we were re reviewing the paper. Uh, but let's go ahead and bring the uh, front page section back. Um, see a pile of sections over there. Uh, and maybe after that, we'll get to the Sunday review. Um, so that well, we let's, will, um, uh, let me just say one yeah. quick thing about the magazine story. So I Please. haven't read it. I haven't read it yet. But um, uh, anything that Susan Dominus writes, I want to read. Uh, she's she's the most she's one of the most empathetic uh, journalists in America. And she writes beautifully. And um, Luke Broadwater is, of course, uh, the guy who did a lot of stuff around January 6th. He was there uh, and he did yes. a lot of stuff for The New Yorker, both on video and, uh, and in print. So I think this has the potential to be an absolutely phenomenal article. And I'm, it, really, looking, I'm really looking forward to reading it. It, it is. I, I did. Uh, I had a chance to read through it. Um, and uh, yes, Luke Broadwater, Broadwater was there. Uh, he co-wrote the piece with Susan. Uh, and in fact, uh, I've been in touch with Susan. We're hoping we'll, she'll be on the show at some point, uh, particularly if we time it with another uh, feature that she wrote. Right. Um, it, was, it was very strong. As I mentioned earlier, my neighbor is a Capitol Hill uh, police officer, uh, and he was on, he's on the bike patrol along with Brian Sicknick, who died of his uh, injuries yeah. just shortly after. So it's very real and very... Um, Poignant and and the profiles that she writes of the various officers, their experience that day, their experience in the uh, um, days after, uh, months after, is really incredible. Uh, so certainly, I uh, want to encourage folks to take a look at that that piece. Why don't we go ahead? This is a great picture um, of uh, Sergeant uh, Gunnell, um, uh in physical therapy, uh, right on the inside. Um, and then the story itself, um, just to take a look at the way that it's laid out and, uh, you know, the scars of January 6th for many officers of the U.S. Capitol Police, their bodies, minds, and lives will never be the same. Um, photographs for, by Philip Montgomery as well. Photographs were really great uh, as well. This is a um, portrait of Carolyn Edwards, one of the officers attacked that day. Um, Daniel, uh, De Devin Gowdy. Uh, another officer, Dominic uh, uh, 
Trakosh. Uh, the pull quote, I was so destitute that it didn't matter. I was feeling nothing. Um, this is the California fire story. This is the California yeah, fire. Uh, another wonderful writer, uh, really uh, one of the stars of the times now, young stars is uh, Jay Caspian Kang. And he has an article uh, in the magazine called The Boy King of YouTube. And it's about- The Boy King of YouTube. I saw that headline. Yeah. So there's another story I want to read again, not so much because I care about the subject, but because I care about the writer. Um, you know, maybe this is something that only other, I, I, you know, bylines mean a lot to me. Um, they, I make a lot of decisions on what to read and what not to read based on bylines. Uh, I, I know that probably most readers don't do that, but I, but I certainly do. And, um, you know, Jay Caspian Kang has also written some really excellent uh, op-ed pieces. He's got a really interesting job as a, as a quasi op-edder and a quasi magazine writer. This is it's in, in interesting in terms of the way they did the, the layout and the graphic design on this. Uh, Ten-year-old Ryan uh, Kaji and his family have turned videos of him playing with toys into a multi-million dollar empire. Uh, the player. Why do so many other kids want to watch? Uh, and by Jay Caspian King, photographs by Alona uh, Suarez. Right. Um, yeah, so, so, so that layout, so there's one thing about that layout that sort of drives me crazy about the Times Magazine generally, which is the type is so goddamn small. Mm. Uh, in, in, this, uh, in this page? On the, the left-hand page, yeah. And they, yeah. Often do that on the uh, they often do that on the cover, too. Just the type is so small you can barely read it. Small font, and um, I mean, unlike this, right? I mean, this is unlike that, but which is Gail, which is great. Yeah, Gail Bisher, if she watches this, she'll kill me. But that, I, I, sorry, Gail, <laughs> I love you. Well, Gail, this is, but... I mean, this is a great example of the uh, cover. I'll see if I get the glare off on the light. You know, you a very dark image holding the badge, but the font for the the headline. I mean, certainly they're trying to understate the headline, but you can barely. Yeah. I even I'll hold it up higher. That's the the headline right there. This is the right, and then the the byline at the bottom. Certainly interesting. Let's uh, take a look at the uh, front section uh, real quick. I mentioned the uh, the display story about Ukraine and and um, you know Russia's uh, massing troops across the border. Um, let's take a look at what's inside. Page two and three are, <clears throat> you have the of interest uh, section and uh, also, uh, you know, the conversation spotlight, the here to help. I am a big fan of the insider column. Uh, and this is a piece actually by Susan and Luke as well, where a source is coming from. Um, mm. It's not uncommon at some point in the interviewing process for reporters to ask sources a simple question. Why are you talking to me? And sometimes not always the answer reveals information that deepens the understanding between source and reporter. Did you ever ask uh, uh, the gentleman, I forget his name, uh, from uh, next door, why yeah. he talked to you? Well, yeah, but you know, that was, that was, the answer was easy. He wanted to put Ike away, and I was his only means of doing so. Uh, you so know, some... he, had, he had gotten bad advice from a lawyer um, about whether he could sue or not. He actually could have sued and probably would have won a malpractice suit. And uh, the statute of limitations had run out when I showed up. And so it was me or nothing. And, um, you know, he, he, he was perfectly open about talking about anything if it furthered the goal of, um, of uh, you know, causing the Department of Health to investigate Ike, which it had not done until the podcast came out. Got it. And, you, Got it. and you know, I, I, in the end, I did lose his license. So, um, you know, that was the good result. Sure. Um, Marty is, Marty's very, very happy. <laughs> Miriam <laughs> has a question. How much do the, uh, uh, the times writers get to, how much do they get to choose their stories on how much they are signed? Um, if you're an opinion writer, obviously you get to uh, go where you want to, for the most part, I assume. Um, yeah, if you're an opinion writer, you mostly have free reign. Um, uh, the mag if you're in, in the newspaper, it's mostly assigned, although you can come up with a, if you come up with a good story idea, they'll let you run, they'll let you run with it. 
But, you know, there's a certain, I mean, I was in the business section, so there's certain things that have to be covered. You know, Tesla is on the front page of today's paper, and that's a good example. Um, uh, but at the magazine, it really is a combination. When I was there, they would have a weekly meeting to talk about story ideas, and sometimes you could propose an idea that they really liked. Um, uh, I would say in my own particular case, I probably... Half the stories were probably generated by me and half of them were generated by the, by the magazine coming to me. Like for instance, I did a big, my last big cover story for the Times Magazine was about Netflix. And that was, uh, that was the magazine's idea. And um, I was very happy about it because I learned a ton about Netflix and, uh, uh, and, about stream and about streaming in general, which has helped me ever since. There's a piece I saw, uh, I can't remember where I saw it online just uh, yesterday. Uh, talking about how so much of the content that we consume now is digital. Uh, Netflix and YouTube uh, in particular are using audio uh, as part of their branding. So when you turn on Netflix and you hear the familiar uh, opening chimes and YouTube does this as well, um, it's part of the experience. It's part of the, it, it triggers the, the memory. Uh, yep. Oh, this is what I'm going to be watching. In um, other words, it's, it's a little Pavlovian. <laughs> a little bit, just a little bit. Um, Ken Ken says he also filters by byline, uh, although he's, he thinks he shouldn't. Um, Roberta is watching from Richmond, Virginia. Roberta, thank you for joining us. Um, and um, let's see if anyone, and then Paula shared uh, the piece on uh, Netflix that you wrote um, uh, for the magazine, Can Netflix Survive in the New World? it created. So thank you, Paula, for, for doing that. Um, also, I, I think we have the answer to that question now. Well, yeah, right. Um, <laughs> yes. Although it is, it is interesting to see how much competition there has uh, and how yeah. the streaming services has, has definitely, now you have to have, you know, three or four streaming services if you want to get the right combination of uh, shows uh, yes. between yes. Paramount and uh, Peacock and Hulu and, yeah, right. Amazon, um, Apple um, uh, Plus, of course. Neil, what am I? Remember, what am I leaving out? Neil, do you remember when people thought a la carte uh, uh, TV would bring their cable bills down? Yeah, right uh, now. <laughs> right. So, so there was one. There was one analyst on Wall Street uh, who um, who didn't believe that, and who said it's ultimately going to cost you more because you're gonna to have to pay for every single thing. And I started writing about that. I probably wrote two or three columns about that. And you know, it's turned out to be exactly right. I'm actually afraid to add up all the services that I have both for music and for TV because it's gotta be over $200 a month. Um, yeah, if you think about all the services, I wasn't thinking about music. Um you know, and other, other services. I, I certainly think about all the apps that I use, particularly around work. Um, but, you know, I was rattling off and we actually cut the cord so we don't get cable anymore, but we use a uh, uh, YouTube TV for our we live. Did, I, did, I use it. We, yeah, we do too. So here's one other thing I got to, okay. This is my genius idea. Can I, can yeah, I sure. This out? Okay. So one of the things that's most infuriating about the modern age is that when you want to look up an article, you have to subscribe to the newspaper. So I'm not against subscribing to local papers. I want to subscribe to local papers, but how many can you subscribe to? And if you're in a hurry and you just want to re read something quickly and the Houston Chronicle is saying, you've got to subscribe for three months and da da da, and then we're automatically going to keep charging you into infinity until you stop. So what I want to do is create a system like ASCAP or BMI for music where you can access, you, you, you have an account and you access individual articles and newspapers all across the country and, and, that, and you pay for it out of your account. And the ASCAP thing distributes the money to all the news, to the various papers. I, I, I think, I mean, I think people would, I think that would be a big deal. I, I think that would be interesting. I, I'd, I'd be curious about the math in terms of, uh, you know, uh, uh, if you're paying per article, uh, I wonder if it'd be similar to the streaming services. Would you end up paying more than you do now uh, subscribing to one or two? Well, maybe it's because I'm a journalist, but, you know, 
in the course of a month, I'm probably asked to subscribe to 40 different publications. Sure. Sure. I can't do that. I can't do that. So then a lot of times I think, well, I can't, I'm, I'm just not going to be able to read that article. I, I have to give up. Well, and, that's um, what, yeah. And if you charge, I mean, I, I mean, I would be willing to pay like a quarter. I'd be willing to pay 50 cents for an article that I wanted. You know, it doesn't have to sure. be pennies the way it is at Spotify. Sure. Um, anyway, I, I, I've always thought that this was an idea that, that could really be a difference maker. But of course, I'm not an entrepreneur. And I'm never going to be an entrepreneur. And I've mentioned this to people like uh, Merrill Brown, who is an entrepreneur, a media entrepreneur, and he kind of scoffs at the idea. So um, anyway, it's just I, I, maybe somebody's listening to this who says, ha, ah, I can do that and go out and raise money and make it happen. You, you might be onto something. Uh, Chitachi thinks that'd be quite a model. Uh, w wondering whether individual newspapers would be receptive to that, uh, whether they would... Uh, they Sign would have on. To, right. They would have to figure out the economics. And the way you would figure out the economics is you'd have to figure out how many, how many rejections are you getting? How many people are coming to your site? Bouncing. Yeah. Seeing the thing and saying, no, I'm not going to do that. And yeah. I, think if it, I think if the number was high enough, like the Boston Globe, for instance, the Boston Globe sports page. You know, how many people want to read a Dan Shaughnessy article after the Red Sox beat the Yankees? <laughs> Oh, and, when um, when did that happen last? I can't remember. Well, I just remember right? 2004. 2004. Oh, yeah, one year. Okay, I'll give you one year. <laughs> 27 <laughs> championships for the Yankees. I'll take that. Sure. <laughs> um, but anyway, how many, uh, you know, the Boston Globe sports page, sports page was and remains one of the great sports pages in the U.S., but I'm not going to subscribe to the Boston Globe just to read, you know, two articles a month, two columns a month by Dan Shaughnessy. I'm just not going to do it. Sure, sure. Go Yankees, of course. Um, but uh, but Chitachi had that. Karen actually says, Karen Arena is watching. Uh, she says it exists uh, somewhat in with Nickel Pass. Are you familiar with Nickel Pass? I'm not, but I'm going to go look it up as soon as we get off the air. We're going to want to look into that. Uh, Ken Fisher has the same uh, challenge that you do. Uh, yeah. So he uh, agrees. And, and Carla thinks that that would work. Um, ASCAP uh, style way of paying uh, for journalism. Um, Miriam I mean, says, it, I think, yeah. I mean, if it works for music, it ought to work for articles. You know? Sure. Um, Miriam says that the dilemma, the media has to earn enough money to exist. Uh, but if an article or program is really important, people should be able to access it without being dependent on money. Um, Nickelpass.com is the website, easy enough to, to find. All right. Um, I'll check it out, Karen. Thank maybe you. interview the uh, founder. Um, right. And uh, Roberta says that uh, the founder of Waze, uh, Noam Bardin, is doing something um, similar, uh, maybe. So I want to check that out. All right. Uh, the New York Times is part of Nickel Pass, so that's, that's good. Um, and um, All right. I am Roberta's 100%. I'm 100% going to look at Nickel Pass. And if it does what you says it is, maybe I'll see if I can get Sorkin to, to let me run a column about it on, in Dealbook. That would be great. That would be great. And you can let them know that you heard about it on three Sunday New York Times read-along. There you go. There you what do go. you think? Um, I love it. I love Roberta it. says the idea behind Pago Media is that readers should make micropayments for each article they read instead of paying a fixed subscription fee. So look at Pago as well. Maybe there, okay. there are a few few options to, to check out over there. Um, See, we're, 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 we're changing the world here, baby. I know. This is, this is great. And we're only on page two of the, of the paper. Uh, Sorry, so let's, that's, my, that's my fault. I guess. No, no, no. This is great. This is great. Um, the rest of the, uh, the A1, let's take a look at uh, real quick. Um, at more Indian weddings, expect some magic. That's on the uh, a big story on the left-hand side. Uh, clockwise, like many marriage ceremonies these days in the coastal state of Kerala, uh, the wedding of Dr. Shehab Pfizer at center included music, extravagant outfits, and lots of dancing. Choices inspired by social media. A chandelier from China that can be rented for wedding events. Um, and there's a picture of Dr. Pfizer being decorated in henna. Um, it's turning uh, this, um, 
pull quote, turning one stage ceremonies into lively YouTube moments. Interesting. Uh, definitely want to check that out. Here's a full page ad on the right. Uh, you can see the top half of it, proud to vaccinate the world against COVID-19. This is from Texas Children's Hospital. Um, and this is, uh, you know, they're touting, they recently announced that um, Corbivax, a COVID-19 vaccine um, that was co-developed with the Hyderabad-based vaccine and pharmaceutical company Biological E Limited um, has been approved for use in India. Uh, and if I'm not mistaken, I believe that they were distributing it for free, um, which is one of the things that uh, people have talked about. It's one thing to get vaccines, vaccines here in the U.S., but until we get more people vaccinated overseas, it'll be hard to get ahead of this pandemic. Um, there's an article, Chinese rights activists gathered in 2019 um, and Beijing was watching. Um, and here's a full page ad from when we all vote, uh, fight for our vote. Um, and this is certainly uh, about January 6th. Um, signed by Michelle Obama, founder of When We All Vote. So that's something certainly worth looking into. Um, this is a continuation of the piece on Ukraine um, on the left-hand side, a full page on the left. And then this uh, story about uh, Novak uh, Djokovic, uh, his detention uh, going to the Australian Open. Um, what seemed interesting, it, it from what I gathered, he had a waiver uh, for because he's not vaccinated, um, but he didn't have the right visa, and he ran afoul of uh, their immigration uh, uh, laws. Your take on uh, the Joker? I'm sorry. Oh, I think I didn't realize that we'd, uh, we'll, we'll wait. Joe is uh, logging back on. There we go. Yep, Joe? I'm back. Yep, I had that a little... Little Wi-Fi trouble. No worries. Uh, I was just asking you about your take on Novak uh, Djokovic. Um, um, you know, uh, his, my take is, of course, he should get kicked out of the country. <clears throat> but um, the thing that people, the thing that the, the sports journalists haven't really focused on um, is that so much of this reaction to him by the government is being driven by the fact that the no country has been more locked down crazy than Australia. And people have just spent a long, long time in their homes, um, unable to do anything except go to the grocery store. And so the fury, the fury of the populace, um, knowing that, that Djokovic had, had, had uh, kind of squeezed his way in uh, uh, with his exception, exemption, just, just, just drove, I mean, it just drove people crazy. And, um, and, and that's why the government reacted the way it did. And, and the chances of him playing in the Australian Open is pretty much zero. Um, uh, and, and, you know, he's going to have the same problem in France. And he's going to have the same problem in London. But, he, he, of course, he won't have it in the U.S. Do you think the, the, some of it was more uh, – so I would mentioned my, my reading. I, I thought I saw something. There was a problem with his visa where he got an exemption for, for the Australian Open but didn't have the right visa – do you think it was more a, you know, uh, a change of heart where they realized this was a mistake to give him an exemption and they pulled the plug? Well, I do think it sounds like the Australian Open made a mistake by giving the, him the exemption for the tournament without going to the government and making sure it was OK for the government. Exactly. Uh, so, you know, um, I don't think there was a mistake in the visa. I just think he came and the government said, you know, you, you haven't followed the rules for us. And, um, uh, you know, he's well known as a, as an anti-vaxxer. And so people knew he was going to come unvaccinated. And, um, uh, 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 so, uh, you know, maybe if people had didn't care, or had wanted him to come or it hadn't been a big deal, they would have let him in. But, you know, there was no way it was going to happen. Correct. Correct. So let's see, what else do we have? Uh, I'll get through uh, the front page section. Um, we have uh, facing turmoil. The Kazakh president uh, chose his path, embraced Russia. That's on the left-hand side. Uh, this piece on the right is about the uh, uh, Colorado wildfire 
uh, evacuees, little is left but loved ones. Uh, they've gone through uh, a lot uh, in Colorado, incredible uh, between the fires and the snow, several uh, mass shootings. Um, for low-income families, crowding under one roof is not a choice. Uh, poor households often pay more than half of their income in rent. I remember reading at one point that it was, you know, if you're paying a third of your income in for housing, that's about the right um, percentage. Um, and uh, there was a comment, Ellen had said the government said no, but the tournament said yes, that was uh, part of the, that was the, the problem um, with uh, Novak Djokovic. Um, there's that like, article about- do you, like do you like tennis, Neil? Uh, casually, not particularly. Yeah. Yeah. I, okay. Well, Novak is a is a amazing, amazing, amazing player. He certainly he is. is. I mean, he's up there with with Rafa Nadal and and Federer. Uh, yep. But as a human being, there is a lot uh, <laughs> left to be desired. Um, yeah. You know. you know. And somebody said. I mean, the Times actually wrote a story that more or less said uh, his quirks used to be, you know, something people just rolled their eyes about. Um, especially his quirks around health. But now with the pandemic, they're, they're suddenly super serious and nobody's laughing anymore. Well, it was also his, his views on, on uh, um, women players and how they were getting paid as well. And he, he tried to start his own uh, tour, right? Yeah, but see, this is the good side of him, actually. Djokovic is leading a movement to ensure that the lower ranked players make more money. The bottom line in, in tennis, if, if, you're the, if you're the hundredth best basketball player, you're making millions and billions of dollars. If mm -hmm. you're the hundredth best tennis player, you lose money with every tournament. I mean, you just can't make a living. So Djokovic was re is actually trying to get more money for those players so that they can make a living and, and, and help the tour. And uh, sadly, Federer and Nadal are against it. I don't know how this is going to turn out, but um, it, it's, uh, it's another good issue for Dealbook, isn't it? Hmm. Yeah. And again, another uh, quasi uh, hat tip for the read-along. Came up with a story in a conversation on three Sunday New York Times read-along. I can see go. a little... You know, a little uh, at <laughs> yes. the bottom of your piece, maybe. Uh, just <laughs> yes, that's right. <laughs> uh, it's nine uh, uh, forty-seven. I want to uh, pull out the review section. Um, yes. As I mentioned earlier, there are several pieces um, related to January sixth uh, in this week's uh, Sunday review. Um, and in general, I want to ask you about the the review. Um, you know, we have a piece by. Uh, Farhad um, Manju, Mastering the Art of Relaxation. Uh, and uh, the CDC is Leaving You on Your Own um, by Zainab. Uh, uh, I'm not sure how to pronounce her last, uh, last name, uh, Tufek Tufekci. Um, and then uh, this, this middle piece, the centerfold, which is great, An Assault on the Truth. Um, this opinion by Rebecca Solnit, a historian and activist and the author of um, Orwell's Roses, a campaign of lies has revealed just how gullible Americans are. Um, this is the piece by Jimmy Carter in the bottom corner, um, just to show you where it's situated. Um, America's democracy is in danger in the bottom left. Uh, but that center picture, What the World Saw That Day by Francis Fukuyama. Um, and then How Will History Remember? by John uh, Grinspin and Peter Mansow. Um, the lens of history often distorts the past, imbuing it with nostalgia. What can you tell us about uh, the review section? What are your thoughts on that? Well, I, <clears throat> I haven't read the paper paper, the dead tree paper in years. And um, as a result, <clears throat> if you don't, if you only look online, you don't even know that there is a review section pretty much because if you go to opinion, you know, you just get, you just get the stories, you just get the columns. Um, so, you know, I now see, okay, stop right there. Now to me, the most interesting story in, in the section is the black utopia by Brent. Correct. 
Correct. It's it's a wonderful piece. It's a wonderful about, piece. About Seneca and makes, Village. Right. And and what makes it wonderful is it it, it you don't expect it. it. It's out of the blue. And you know, the like then Maureen's column on the right hand side, you know, okay, yeah, 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 yeah. Trump coup, blah, 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 blah. What tell me what tell me what's in there that I didn't know. Oh, I've just I've just shot myself in the head, haven't I? Um, <laughs> um but you know, I I want the unexpected, and I want um, not just good writing, but good, but original thinking. And um, the best, to me, the best columnists at the times are the ones who do that. And I know that's going to drive people crazy when I say this, but I really like Brett Stevens for this reason. Um, uh, you know, I don't, I don't always know what he's going to say. Brett, and Brett Staples. And Steven, Steven, oh, Steven. Brett Stevens. Oh, Brett Stevens, Brett I Stevens. love, but he, you know, he's not a regular columnist. This is an unusual. Sure. Um, uh, I like, I like Brett Stevens because, you know, I don't, I don't always know what he's going to say. I like this. Um, and even if I disagree with him, he, at least he makes me think. And, and you go on the Twitter sphere and, and they're all like, oh yeah, he's just another tool of the right, blah, blah, blah. Well, I don't, re I don't, you know, forget it. You know, that's, that's, that's a large part of the problem with society generally is that it's not willing to listen to anybody on the other side. Um, and one of the things I tried to do when I was a col columnist was, was um, write about things that other people weren't writing about and, 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 and give people a different, different take than they were, than they were, than they normally got. And um, you know, sometimes that was accepted and sometimes it wasn't, but, um, th but that's the way I think about this. Now the, 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 the January 6th pieces I have not read yet. Um, mm -hmm. I certainly will. They look interesting. They look smart. But I just was sort of giving you my general overall sense. Sure. Let me, let me say one other thing. Um, you know, when I wrote for the, for the op-ed page, uh, everybody uh, had their assigned days. Mine was Tuesday and Saturday. Um, you know, Krugman was Monday and Friday. Uh, David Brooks was the same. And Nick Kristoff was, I think, Thursday and Saturday. I can't quite remember, you know. So, and um, I miss that. Um, I always thought when I went down to the sports page, when I went from the whatever floor it was to the to the back to the newsroom, um, you know, I had this idea that I was going to write every Saturday. And and uh, Jason Stallman said, you know, no, 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 no. With the internet, nobody cares about that anymore. And maybe he's right, I don't really know, but I, I found it, um, I, I, I always liked appointment reading. I always liked knowing I could get up on Saturday and read Brett Stevens, or I could get up on Sunday and read Maureen and, and, and Ross Duhat. And, and, um, and the, current, uh, the current thinking, not just at the Times, but pretty much everywhere, is that that doesn't matter anymore that you can just uh, there'll always be somebody and just pick it up and see who's there so um anyway that's something that i miss. that's something that i personally miss sure I, one thing I, before we leave the opinion i just wanted to, to point out and i thought it was interesting and i think that this has been happening for a bit um but again because of the the reliance on, on online it's hard to tell there is an, an unsigned editorial uh, in the Sunday paper. This is a, a piece by Brent Staples. Um, and I think that's, they, they made that shift at some point. I don't know when they did that, um, but not having an unsigned editorial in the Sunday paper, I thought was interesting. Yes, indeed. You're absolutely right. I hadn't noticed that, but if you go on the homepage, the lead is Maureen's um, piece. And then the second, as you go down the thing, and Lindsey Krauss on uh, Novak Djokovic, Aras on Don't Look Up, Patrick Healy on the focus groups, January 6th focus groups, then Brent. Um, then this is, looks interesting. You know what would help exhausted doctors and nurses? More money. That's an interesting piece. Um, so yeah, you're right. It's, there isn't. They usually, on the homepage, they usually lead with, um, uh, they usually lead with the editorial. And, and what, what's also interesting is that if you look at the piece uh, by Jimmy Carter online, uh, so we'll pull that up just as a, uh, uh, an example, there was actually an editorial uh, about January 6th. 
Um, so when you when you yeah. go there, uh, let's see if we can pull that up real quick. Um, so here's the the Jimmy Carter piece, and when you scroll down, it, it's it's so much more prominent uh, certainly than the layout that they gave in print. Um, but this is part of a collection of events on January 6th, which we saw, and then. When you look at this, the uncomfortable lessons, the editorial board argues that the threat to the country didn't end with the storming of the Capitol. Um, and, and that's interesting that that piece is, is uh, it was January 1st is what it's dated online um, and didn't make it into this uh, package, which is, which is interesting. Well, it's, um, sort of, it's, it's undeniable that the online experience is superior to the um, to the paper experience. There's so much more in it. Um, and you can you can do stuff like you just showed where you where you have the article, you have the one article, and then you have this this box sure. of links. And um, um, you know, I used to I used to go to the paper to see what decisions the editors were making in terms of priorities. And I don't mm-hmm. do that any, I don't do that anymore. I just feel like you're getting you're getting you're getting that online now. You're getting what, what the priorities are. And there's so much more on the homepage than there is on a front page that you can really understand what the paper's all about that day just by looking at the homepage. So, I mean, um, anyway, I haven't, I mean, I don't read anything on paper anymore because my eyes aren't the greatest and, and the iPad just works so much better for me. If somebody sends me a book, I'll actually download it from from Kindle and read it <laughs> that way. So um, anyway, well, I'll tell you what's I, what's interesting. You should say that because one of the things that we talk about. I mean, the 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 show itself. I mean, the Sunday New York Times read along. It is uh, you know an homage to print, uh, to the New York Times, to journalism in general. But one thing that often comes up in our conversations is the power of print, seeing the layout, the design, and also serendipity. Uh, you will often find articles in print that you wouldn't have found online because, you know, you click on that Jimmy Carter op-ed, for example, and then you see related stories and you, and you kind of stay in a track. Whereas when you flip through, your eye might be drawn to a cut line or a pull quote. I wouldn't have seen, I didn't see the article about Indian weddings, for example, uh, in right. my perusal of right. online stories yeah no they, um, they had it up they had it up yesterday they had it up last night but it's not up this morning yeah uh so it's just it's interesting yeah. um and uh uh a couple of thoughts uh, on that joan uh that says good writing original thinking yes great design visuals um and that goes for both online and um in print we certainly Absolutely. like to highlight when when the times does great stuff online we show that as well i mean some of the video work and the graphics, uh, you can't really uh, uh, beat. Uh, my mom um, is glad that we always have uh, knowledgeable guests. Uh, Joe, she puts you in that category. Um, Thank you. Thank you, mom. So, <laughs> it's like a, a rainbow with different colors, uh, and each color is important. Um, Ellen looks at both the online and dig- uh, at both online. I assume she means online and print. Uh, give me the paper every time. Um, Digital subscriptions allow you to share stories, which is always good. Um, and uh, want to um, say hi to uh, uh, Cherie, I think it is, and uh, you know, on the pronunciation. Uh, apologize. Uh, Eve uh, Botello is watching as well. She likes both print online. Um, Miriam says one of the reasons that this program is great is for people who subscribe leaves out things that you might not see uh, without the print. Mm-hmm. We have people in California who watch before they get the paper. They The paper hits their driveway around 8, 9 o'clock local time. They watch this show and then uh, dig in. Uh, Naomi is a digital fan who appreciates hard copy. Uh, their neighbor leaves uh, his Sunday uh, paper for them on Monday, which is nice. Um, and Chitachi uh, uh, says thank you for the conversation. So, Joe, what I'd like to do is that we're approaching 10 o'clock. If you have just a few more minutes, um, uh, I want to um, uh, make a few announcements and then bring you back for some final thoughts and uh, also to share a pro tip with our readers. Uh, Again, 
Uh, our guest uh, has been Joe Nocera. Uh, next week, uh, Shri will be back, and our guest will be Aaron Morrison, who is a national writer on race and ethnicity for the Associated Press. Uh, so you'll want to join us uh, for that show as well. Um, and again, another shout out for our production team, uh, Paula Kiger, Steve Taylor, Julia Weeks, and Carla Baranakis. Uh, they do a great job uh, bringing the show every week. Uh, and when we uh, talk about Carla, we also want to talk about um, the Local Connection newsletter. Uh, the Center for Cooperative Media at Montclair State University brings you the Local Connection newsletter. Each week it offers story ideas and pro tips for journalists. And best of all, it's free. You can subscribe at bit.ly slash local news tips, bit.ly slash local news tips. Uh, and we also wanna give a shout out to our sponsor, Muckrack. Uh, thank you for your support um, of our show. Um, one of the things that we did not get a chance to talk about, Joe, um, if you have a quick moment, uh, Sydney Poitier uh, died this week at 94. Um, did you have a uh, particular movie that you liked? No, you know, I was I was a kid when he was do, at the height of his fame and and the and the and the height of his movies. So I don't never really got to see them. I tell you the one, you know, the, the the one thing of his that you cannot see is the Porgy and Bess that he did. Um, now Porgy and Bess has made a great revival, but as you'll see in the obituary, he talks about how much he didn't want to do it because he thought it was demeaning to black people, and um, I've always wanted to see it. I think Porgy and Bess is uh, one of the great. I mean, it is. It's the great American opera. Um, not that they did it as an opera. So, um, uh, but you can't you can't see it. Sure. Times has some great coverage uh, and appreciation of his his obit. And again, when you look, we're talking about uh, online. Um, if you if you see the page, uh, let me see if I can if we're seeing the full at the very top. Yeah, you do. So um, at the very top, you see a link to the obit uh, and appraisal. Um, by um, um, Wesley Morris, uh, tributes to Poitier, a streaming guide uh, on finding uh, his uh, great performances, um, certainly in the heat of the night, uh, yeah. and um, you know, No Way Out, Edge of the City, Raisin in the Sun, uh, of yeah. course, um, Patch of Blue, and then uh, Guess Who's Coming to Dinner. Yes, my father took my father took me to that when I was a kid. Yeah, yeah, some incredible, incredible work. Um, so with that, Joe, uh, a, fi a final thought from you uh, on writing, particularly uh, with the local connection. We include uh, Carla is able to include pro tips for writers. Uh, so, what would you, what would your uh, uh, <laughs> advice be to? Uh, whether it's a, an opinion right as an opinion writer or a business writer or writing in general. Oh uh, yeah, yeah, I, I don't know, man. Um, <clears throat> opinion writing is like have one have one idea. Don't don't try to cram too much. Don't try to cram too much into an op-ed. Just just have one core idea uh, and and run with it. Um, uh, you know, writing in general, I don't. I, I don't I don't know what to say. It's a complicated, you know, book writing versus magazine writing versus newspaper writing. Um, I, 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 I hate to fail here, but I'm failing. No, no, no there's no failure uh, here, Joe. There's no failure. And, and I think that your your first point was definitely well taken. Um, a, a final thought, just in terms of, uh, you know, your work, what, what's next for you? What do you see? Uh, working on over the next uh, several years? Um, I'm planning on doing a lot more podcasts. Uh, I've gotten I've gotten connected with a podcast company based out of London that's fairly new and that I have, uh, that I think is going to be great, Blanchard House. And, um, you know, and writing, I, mean, I plan to write more books uh, in my 70s. And I mean, I'm almost 70 years old. And um and I'm writing for Dealbook. Well, they know I'm writing for Dealbook. My wife is uh, kibitzing now. She's she Dealbook. Dealbook. I, mention she Dealbook. She thinks I undersell myself, right, honey? Um, that's that's <laughs> certainly possible. Uh, I mean, there's a lot to uh, um, to talk about. 
Here is uh, your latest piece for Dealbook, just so folks uh, see it. Uh, why are lawyers doing the work of lawmakers? Uh, this piece right. came out in uh, December. Soon companies that contributed to the opioid epidemic may not be the most effective way to hold them accountable. Um, and you just started working with Dealbook again in the last few months, correct? Right. Once, once I left, uh, once I left Bloomberg, Andrew, uh, got in touch with Andrew actually got in touch with me and said, um, you know, we'd love to have you. We write essays. We do essays on Saturdays and we'd love to have you. So I've done three so far. I'm going to try to do one a month for the foreseeable future. And, you know, once the book is done, maybe even more. So I'm, I'm, I'm super excited about it. I'm really glad to be back in the times. You know, I feel, it feels like home to me. It feels like coming home. And, um, uh, you know, I like the people, I like the ethos. It's just, it's a very comfortable place for me to be. Absolutely. And I like the leadership. Yeah. Yeah. You know, Dean Bakke yeah. had to bless, had to bless this because uh, I had left and, um, uh, and he did. And I was very, very happy about that. The, they had to I bless, bless your go. return. Well, yeah. Thank yeah. you very much, Joe. I, I appreciate it. I was just saying that he had to bless your return. Um, but thank you very much, Joe. We went a little bit over 10 o'clock. Uh, thank yeah, you for your absolutely. time. And uh, uh, we will say, uh, say goodbye to everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Neil. Bye-bye. This was fun. All righty. Goodbye, everybody. Thank you.